force government private sector collusive suppression and censorship of speech that actually cost Donald Trump the 2020 election. Why do I say that? Because if you look at the actual total that President Trump lost in the four to five states that mattered for the Electoral College margin, it was roughly 40 to 45 million votes. And if you then go state by state and you look at the percentage of people who told pollsters that if they had heard of the Hunter Biden laptop story, which as many people here know, Facebook and Twitter worked actively with the federal government, the FBI and the deep state to censor that, a, a, a large enough percentage of voters told pollsters that if they knew about that, they would have actually changed their vote, that the math actually works out, that it's quite possible that suppression of speech and this public-private collusion via the big tech oligarchs literally cost President Trump a second term. Now, as far as the remedies go, um, I've, I, in, a, in a U.S. context, I've written and spoken about this at, at great length. Uh, we have a particular statute from 1996 when it comes to the big tech platforms called Section 230, which basically gives our, our tech platforms extra legal immunity to basically take whatever content down they want for whatever reason whatsoever. I have argued in favor of using the law to tie that immunity to uh, a First Amendment standard. Put another way, if the government cannot censor you for what you would say on a, on a public sidewalk, they should not be able to censor you on a quote-unquote private platform, which we now know is not very private. They're working with the federal government anyway. Um, I have also argued in favor of more aggressive antitrust enforcement, which kind of goes at odds with much of kind of conservatism inc. doctrine, but I think it's well past time for conservatives to try to realize what is going on with a distinctly corporate tyranny that we have here in the 21st century and rise to the challenge and start busting up some of these horrifically woke actors that are doing immeasurable social harm and civilizational destruction. And then finally, I've also argued in, in favor of common carrier regulation, which is an old English common law concept that would basically regulate them the same way that in the United States, for example, we regulate the telephone companies and uh, your internet providers as well. But if you do that, where do you break off friends? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you even break off Facebook into, for example, six different companies if you were to do that? So look, I mean, Meta is a great example. I mean, Meta has acquired over the years Instagram, WhatsApp, Spotify. I mean, Meta has immeasurable companies at this point, right? So I mean, there's no compelling reason whatsoever why Meta should necessarily have been able to legitimately acquire WhatsApp or Spotify. I mean, take Google, for example. Google's uh, market share when it comes to their search in particular, in the United States at least, is north of 90%. Their market share for digital advertising in particular, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's 70 to 80% roughly. I mean, they are they are a total, complete monopolist, these companies. Amazon, too, to a lesser extent. You What's know, your take, Tim? this is true even in traditional media, in the old-fashioned television and radio, because it, it used to be, American law was, no one entity could own more than two FM stations and one AM station in any one market. And that was intentionally done so that no one dominated the message in that market. That has all been changed. You can now own six FM and four AM if you're in New York or if you're in Boston or if you're in Washington, which means these large conglomerates have essentially bought up the uh, radio and television, the broadcasting rights in every town. You have two or three ownerships in every big city, and if those two or three ownerships happen to lean to the left, then the message that is delivered all is to the left. So if you go back backwards in law to the old days where it was two and one instead of six and four, you would have any number of different companies, any number of different approaches to how to deliver media. Uh, and, I mean, there used to be laws that required a certain amount of broadcast time be spent in information. You had to, pre even if you were a music entity, you had to pre present news and other aspects somewhere in your broadcast day. Uh, and that's all gone away. So I, I think the softening uh, has lent itself to a uh, monopoly type situation where you've got very few people delivering a message in broadcast, and I think you're right. That same thing is happening when they buy up Instagram, when they buy up all these entities, and all of a sudden it is one group deciding what message is heard from several platforms. Right. If I understand correctly, Josh, you're arguing some, for some sort of you know, structure, structure based intervention from the government in order to ensure uh, that uh, for each free speech is, uh, is enforced, but uh, here in Europe we are, well, we know very well what government intervention looks like. Would that actually help or would that hinder the process? What do you think, Eva? 
Um, I would like the government to stay out of my business as much as possible, and especially when it comes to the media and, well, when it comes to freedom of speech. I, I would say that here in Europe, the fact that we don't, most of our countries don't have an equivalent of the First Amendment is one of our biggest problems. Um, in my country, you can be quite literally criminally prosecuted for even offending certain minority groups. And if you look at me and think, oh, does that ever happen? Well, yes, it does happen. It actually also happens to politicians, like Geert Wilders, who have been convicted for, uh, for those crimes, quote unquote. And that is just a trend that we see everywhere. So this is something that is going to affect all of us. And like I said, misinformation is just a cover up term for anything I don't agree with. And that is something that is incredibly dangerous for all of us. You know, at first they, they say that you're a victim of misinformation. Then after that, you are maybe someone who spreads misinformation, then it already starts to get very, very dangerous. And what if you make it up, quote unquote? Well, like I said, we have seen already that they are working on legislation that could potentially label you a, an enemy of the state or an enemy of democracy. If you are undermining democracy with misinformation just because you go against what the mainstream narrative is, then what is free speech even, right? So I... Um, I am worried about that. I don't want the government to regulate any of that. I think we need deregulation rather than regulation. I mentioned earlier how in the United States, uh, talk radio is dominated by conservatives. And there have been attempts to put together national radio programs from the left, and they inevitably fail. There is not the same demand as there is for information from the right. And that's a free market. That is free speech. And maybe five years ago, maybe a little longer than that, Democrats in the United States Congress were clamoring for a law that would require some sort of balance. Rather than having a free market determine what people want to hear, they wanted to determine that some of the content would be from the left and some of the content would be from the right. And you and I both know then who's going to determine what information falls into each category. And, and if the government gets involved there, then essentially the government is determining what you're going to listen to on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think that's, I, I'm in complete agreement with you. I don't want the government getting involved in trying to tell me what I can broadcast on a day-to-day -day basis, or Josh what he can broadcast on a day-to-day -day basis, or what our, our syndicated outlets can broadcast on a day-to-day -day basis. I think making sure the government stays as far away from that and let the people decide what they want to listen to because truthfully, if they don't like my content, I'm not going to still be on the radio. Josh? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that this you know, notion that those of us on kind of the more nationalist and populist elements of the right that are calling for more government intervention to restore the status quo of regime media versus dissident media, we're actually just trying to restore a culture of free speech that has been swatted down and greatly diminished due to decades-long collusion between the public sector and the private sector. So I, 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 I can go step by step here. So when I, I mentioned common carrier regulation earlier, all common carrier regulation for the big tech platforms would do would mean that the social media platforms, Google search, they cannot discriminate based on your Twitter algorithms or on your Google search algorithms, based on your political viewpoints, your religious ideology, or discriminate based on anything that other US laws, such as, such as the First Amendment, would prohibit you from discriminating on. When it comes to antitrust enforcement, the entire purpose of antitrust enforcement, and, and ideally kind of spinning off Amazon, Google, and, and Meta into smaller companies, would be to restore a culture of free speech. Similarly, when it comes to what I mentioned, our somewhat unique law known as Section 2, 230, what I said is that we should actually tie this extra legal immunity provision that Congress gave the tech platforms to a First Amendment standard, which is just meaning that we should make it so that whatever you say in social media cannot be censored if it, if it could otherwise not be censored if it was set on a public sidewalk. So all this is getting to the aim of free speech. My question back to you once more is, uh, even though these are very clear uh, obstacles and difficulties and uh, the collusion is, I think, uh, apparent, uh, did social media not help your rise, by the way? I mean, uh, could you have achieved your success without social media? I mean, you have a large following there. 
Look, I, 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 Twitter in particular, I mean, I've met a lot of friends on Twitter. Twitter's been good to me. I mean, I'm not sure what to say about it. Uh, look, many of my other friends have been treated not so well on Twitter, but most importantly, I think that Twitter has assumed the role in our current discourse of a vital, vital function that is analogous to the modern day public square. And here's the, this is the key point. This is the key point that if I want you to take away any lesson, here's what I would want you to take away. You know, back when America rebelled against the British back in the 1770s and 1780s, you know, uh, we, we had this uh, man named Thomas Paine who would run around the Philadelphia Commons with his pamphlet, Common Sense, trying to stir up, stir up rebellious sentiment among the colonists. And, you know, he was, that was the public square back then. It was these literal physical town commons. So something like the First Amendment would naturally apply to government property. What is the town square today? I mean, no one's going out in the streets of the, uh, or the town square to literally pass out pamphlets. Our functional town square is social media. The problem is that under current law, our constitutional protections do not apply to private media. So that, that is the paradigm that we're trying to rethink here, and it is only exacerbated by this, uh, by this collusion between the public and the private sector that we have never seen before. Eva, you're also very successful on social media. What's your take on this? Well, I mean, I quite literally wouldn't be sitting here without Twitter, I think. Um, Twitter has been a massively important uh, platform for me. But even quite recently, a couple of months ago, I received, I think, uh, arguably the shortest permanent ban in Twitter history uh, from one day to the next. And mind you, this was already when Elon had purchased Twitter, so this was already under Elon's rule, so to say. I uh, opened my Twitter account and suddenly found out that I was permanently banned without any warning, without any explanation given, and that showed me the vulnerability of that position. And thankfully, I also have made a lot of friends on Twitter, and with a reinstate Ava campaign, thankfully, I was back within four hours, but I never officially heard what the reason for my suspension was. And like I said, that is a vulnerable and dangerous position to have, and we all have that in a way. If I lose my account, it's pretty much done for me. So even with Elon here now and the EU still you know, already threatening to fine him uh, on the basis of, again, this Digital Service Act, if you don't know it, look it up, it's horrible. A little peek into our future, I would say. Um, yeah, so we, I don't think we can put all of our hope or solace into one individual or one platform. Fortunately, the left, who isn't sure what a woman is, also didn't know what permanent was. So we're okay. <laughs> True. Right. So um, last question for all of you. Uh, Tim, uh, I think you said that you know, free speech is uh, much like a wave where we're in kind of a valley now, but there are still hills to come uh, and better times ahead. Uh, what do you think the steps are, and I'm asking this to each of you, what are th like three concrete steps that should be done immediately uh, to help uh, you know, increase the free speech uh, in the Western world? Three I, steps. I think, the, for me, uh, probably the most important is in the world of education. And it's, that steps away from broadcasting or steps away from social media. But I, we just published a piece today in the Washington Times about the commencement speakers. It's graduation time. And if you go to colleges all over the United States, you will find politicians and bureaucrats from the left you will find nearly no one from the right because the educational system is set up to try to influence young adults. My son is in college now, uh, but that goes back into primary school now. They have certain things that are allowed or not allowed. If you wore an Obama t-shirt, you were perfectly fine. If you wore a MAGA hat, M-A-G-A, make America great again. They were afraid that would offend someone. Now, if you live in the United States of America, I'm not sure why you would be offended because you would like to make the country great again. But that, the rules were very different depending on what side of the spectrum you were on. And you now have arguments. It's controversial in the state of Florida because the governor and the state legislature has passed a rule that says they don't want to teach kindergarten, five-year-olds, about lesbian, gay, transgender. That's controversial, that they're not going to have instruction on gay sex to kids that are five and six and seven years old. I, so I, I think the number one thing is we're indoctrinating people so that by the time they're Ava's age, certainly by the time they're my age, then they're, they're going to be so far down the road into being indoctrinated that they don't even realize what they've given up. So I think that's an essential element is make sure we take back that educational element. Ava? Well, we have to understand that the, the battlefield is our mind. So we 
have to stop doing their work for them and not censor ourselves before they do it to us. So the one thing that I would say that we have to do in order to fight this is to keep saying the things that we know are true, but that we are afraid or nervous to say. If we already do the work for them by then shutting up and not saying what the truth is, then we've already lost. So just say those things that you're uncomfortable to say as long as you still can. Yeah. So strongly agree with what my good friend Ava just said. You know, Andrew Breitbart famously said, walk towards the fire, do not be afraid. So that, that, I think that very much uh, encapsulates what Ava said, and I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, as far as kind of three concrete steps that I think we on the right could take, um, one would be, I mean, we, we haven't gotten, unfortunately, to talking about kind of uh, alternative media, altern alternative social media. I think that that is very, very important. Um, we, need, we need donors, we need funders, people who are willing, who, people who are entrepreneurs, who are willing to start alternative media companies, who are willing to start kind of pro-free speech, pro-dissident speech, social media companies. But at the same time, we cannot forsake kind of the vestigial kind of old school institutions. I mean, I work at Newsweek, which has been around for almost 100 years. That's a very old institution. I've managed to find a perch there, uh, you know, and to, to the extent that we can kind of get obviously wealthy donors or people who have made a lot of money who kind of more or less share our views, who can take over an institution that is important, then we should pursue that as well. Elon Musk taking over Twitter is a good example, although I don't think he's actually done a great job, but that's neither here nor there, conversation for another day. But in theory, that's, that's a good example as to how that should work. And finally, then, you know, the various kind of policies, at least for the United States that I pointed out, I think could also kind of help restore free speech culture if successfully pursued. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, thank Tim, you. and Josh. Thank you very much for participating. Good talk. That's all, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.